Distinguished Senior Advisor, Professor Bharat Daya is a global sustainability leader, professional keynote speaker, urbanist, planner, geographer, futurist, educator, team leader, and mentor. He's Director of Research Center for Sustainable Development and Innovation at the School of Global Studies, Thanas University, Bangkok. He is an extraordinary professor at the School of Public Leadership, Stalinbok University, South Africa, and a distinguished professor at Urban Youth Academy, Seoul. He is also a founding board member of the World Smart Cities Economic Development Commission under the World Business Angles Investment Forum. An award-winning urbanist, Professor Dhaya, combines research, policy analysis, and development practice aimed at examining and tackling socio-economic, cultural, environmental, and governance issues in the global context of sustainable development. Since early 1990s, his research and professional work has focused on sustainable cities and urbanization, strategic urban planning and development, urban environment and infrastructure, urban resilience, and cultural heritage and landscape. Working with the World Bank, UN Habitat, the Asian Development Bank, UNUIAS, and UNDP, he initiated, led, and contributed to international projects on sustainable urban development in a number of countries. He conceptualized and coordinated the preparation of United Nations inaugural report on the state of ancient cities 2010-11. At the World Bank headquarters, he conducted the first ever systematic review of the bank's investments for improving urban livability, published as a co-authored book, Urban Environment and Infrastructure Towards Livable Cities. More recently, he co-authored Partnering for Sustainable Development, Guidelines for Multi-Stakeholder Partnerships to Implement the 2030 Agenda in Asia and Pacific, and co-edited New Urban Agenda for Asia Pacific, Governance for Sustainable and Inclusive Cities. Professor Daya advises a number of professional academic, private sectors, and non-profit organizations around the world. He's a member of the International Advisory Board for the UN Habitat's World Cities Report 2020, the value of sustainable urbanization Nairobi. He's also a member of advisory group of Future Earth Urban Knowledge Action Network, Montreal, Canada, and a board member of World Smart Cities Economic Development Commission, World Business Angles Investment Forum, USA. Since early 2014, Professor Dhaya has been the series editor of the Scopus Index Springer book series, Advanced in 21st Century Human Settlements, which has a growing collection of books under the theme. He serves on the editorial boards of the Italy-based geographies of the Anthropocene book series and a number of journals, Environment and Urbanization Asia, Journal of Urban Culture Research, Icon, Journal of Archaeology and Culture, National Geographical Journal of India, Chinese Journal of Population, Resources and Environment, and Jindal, Jindal Journal of Public Policy. He has held academic positions in Australia, Indonesia, South Africa, and Thailand. Reuters, Enterprise Service, SkyDivNet, Nishi Nippon, The Korean Economic, da economic Daily, Chinese China Daily, The Hindu, Tech in Ireland, Bangkok Post, The Nation, etc. have quoted Professor Dhaya's work. For his professional contribution to sustainable urban development in Mongolia, the government of Mongolia awarded him with a certificate of honor and the municipal government of Ulan Bitar decorated him with a medal of honor. He read for his MA in Geography from Jawaharlal Nehru University and Masters of Planning from School of Planning and Architecture, both based in New Delhi, India. He holds a PhD in Urban Governance, Planning and Environment from the University of Cambridge, UK. A researcher understands a researcher very, very well. It's a different genre. People who research are different. And I am very, very happy to have our keynote speaker, Dr. Bharat, Bharat Dhaya. He is not Bharat, he is Bharat, you know, <laughs> and that is his correct introduction. So welcome, Dr. Bharat. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Anand, and uh, thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. You seem to have done a lot of research on me. <laughs> um, so uh, let me uh, start. Uh, maybe first I should say a few things. Um, first of all, uh, greetings from the School of Global Studies, Thammasat University, Bangkok. Um, and I would like to uh, congratulate uh, UVCity and all its knowledge partners 
for organizing this uh, very important conference. And I would also like to thank all of you for having me as your keynote speaker today. Um, I'm also delighted to inform all of you that uh, our school, School of Global Studies at Thammasat University has uh, signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with the UVCT just a couple of days ago. And uh, we will be uh, looking forward to cooperate and collaborate on various academic and research activities. So uh, that will be something to look forward to. Now, when uh, this conference was being planned, I had a discussion with uh, Professor Anand about uh, the topic of my uh, presentation today. And uh, urban villages uh, is a very specific terminology that is used uh, in uh, India. And as uh, Professor uh, Hinazia said, this is almost like an oxymoron. So uh, what we discussed was that I will uh, talk a little bit uh, from a larger perspective, maybe a regional Asian perspective, uh, because I have worked on several countries in the region. And uh, we took a topic of uh, sustainable urbanization and communities to cast a wider net on, uh, on looking into what sort of planning interventions are uh, provided to support communities in different countries. So while I have a limited time and I would like to know how much time uh, I, will, uh, I will have so that I can set my timer, um, but I would like to give you a slice of uh, or a cross section of what has been happening in Asia Pacific region. Uh, Prof Professor Anand, how much time should I keep? Sir, uh, you have a, a good set of 40 minutes with you, sir. Uh, we would like to hear as much from Thamasat and the research center as possible, sir. It is oh. encouraging to have a tie up with you all. It's important for all researchers. So, I mean, Okay, so uh, maybe 30 minutes of talk and maybe some discussion or I'll try to do it earlier, yeah? Yes, so, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so um, with that, uh, let me share my PowerPoint. I'm sure you are able to see it now. Okay. It's visible, sir. Yes, sir, it's visible. That's fantastic. Okay, so uh, let's begin. And uh, the topic that I have today for you is uh, sustainable urbanization and communities and Asian perspective. Um, I have divided this uh, talk into five parts. Uh, first will be a few slides on the challenge of sustainable urbanization. Then we will look at some of the lessons uh, learned from the past experience on the broader topic that we have today. Then we will look at uh, the current understanding and policy advocacy on sustainable urbanization and communities, which sort of is a general global regional perspective. The fourth part will be to look at a couple of examples of uh, planning and development strategies that work. Uh, which means these are the things that actually produce results. And lastly, uh, a few slides on uh, looking towards the future. So in terms of the challenge of uh, sustainable urbanization, uh, there is a quote, a very important quote from the UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon, who said our struggle for global sustainability uh, will be won or lost uh, in cities. And when he mentioned global sustainability, he also, of course, talks about not only environmental issues, but also economic and social issues. And that is uh, important because we have uh, a growing uh, proportion of urban population around the world. In 2020, it was about 56%. And by the end of this decade, it should be according to the estimates, uh, grow to 60%. Now, um, we cannot uh, talk 
about urban development or planning without talking about the pandemic and the new normal things that have been developing. So uh, this is a fresh uh, op-ed uh, by the uh, executive secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific. It talks about tackling the pandemic of inequality. And we know um, from uh, the data that in the Asia Pacific region, more than 81 million jobs uh, have been lost um, due to COVID, many more because this was an earlier estimate. And this has, of course, affected uh, the people who work in cities, especially the informal sector uh, and the poorer communities, the lower income communities. And also we find that uh, the COVID might have pushed almost 90 million people uh, into poverty. And uh, the ones who are most affected are the people who live in informal settlements, uh, and many of them also live in uh, urban villages, or those who are engaged in low paid or insecure jobs. So, um, now, from this kind of particular uh, angle, now let's look at what does the latest uh, report, SDG report of the United Nations says on the SDG 11, which is to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And what we see here, the first thing that we notice is that there are about 1 billion slum dwellers and their condition, their uh, plight has worsened, uh, especially due to COVID. Then we see that there is a lack of uh, open space, uh, which I think is a common problem in uh, poorer communities or the type of urban villages that we are talking about. And also uh, there is a lack of uh, convenient access to uh, public transport. It is found that while uh, 156 countries in the world have national urban policies, but only half of them are implementing them. So uh, there must be many uh, interesting reasons why these urban policies are not being implemented. And that leaves a lot of scope uh, for improvement. So with that, um, Let's uh, look at our topic here. And uh, when I say sustainable urbanization and communities, it covers many uh, things. It of course uh, covers informal settlements where there may be uh, land tenure. There may be uh, squatter settlements where you know there would not be uh, any uh, land tenure. Then you have the specific terminology of urban villages and also other urban settlements uh, which have not received or are not receiving any planning and or development inputs. And I think this uh, is a big area of uh, work um, that uh, we can discuss. And I think it'll be good to have a, a good question answer session. Now, when we uh, say poorer communities, uh, those are really disadvantaged uh, when it comes to um, climate change, and especially if those settlements are underserviced. So we know that the urban poor, they live in uh, more fragile environmental areas, uh, and uh, there is some maybe living in the urban villages that we are discussing, especially those which are low lying. Um, and as a result, they are more vulnerable to uh, different sorts of risk, including related to disasters and climate change. Now, uh, specifically looking at um, the urban villages, uh, this is just one picture I uh, got of uh, Sukrali village. Uh, I was for some reason uh, in India Last year, uh, I was living uh, in a Gurgaon sector area, and this was this was the village next to the place I lived. And I happened to uh, visit uh, it inside and outside, and so on. Uh, and the people are quite uh, 
interested to develop their uh, village into a more developed sort of settlement. So you can see that uh, from this broader general introduction, that sustainable urbanization and communities uh, cover a large topic. So within this larger context, let's uh, look at what are the lessons learned from the past experience. Now, um, our friend, when uh, she was introducing, uh, she was talking about this State of Asian Cities Report 2010-11. This was the first UN report on Asian cities. And we looked at uh, the whole region and there were lots of issues that were covered, including the communities. And since then, there have been several reports like this, uh, at least two more editions uh, of this. And what we found that, uh, especially during the Millennium Development Goal period, where there was a target of 150 million uh, people's lives to be improved in urban settlements, um, during 2020-10, about uh, 227 million slum dwellers' lives were improved uh, worldwide. And out of that 227, 172 million or 75% of the world total were living in Asia and the rest in other parts of the world. So from this graph, you can see that uh, when we talk about the Asian perspective uh, today, uh, Asia is really the region which is focusing on uh, improving uh, the lives of uh, people who are living in poorer communities or unplanned or informal settlements. Now, what, what were those policies and strategies that led to such uh, amazing uh, or impressive achievements? And five were uh, shortlisted. First of them was long-term political commitment. And, and some examples are mentioned, I will not uh, mention all those names, but you can see that these national governments made uh, a commitment that they are going to tackle uh, the problem of uh, communities and their housing and uh, infrastructure development. The second uh, strategy policy was uh, awareness and advocacy. So uh, this is done not only by national governments, but organizations, NGOs, and other uh, institutions like UVCT. The third uh, important uh, intervention was uh, policy reforms and institutional strengthening. So in fact, uh, national governments brought in uh, policies that focused on providing access to land, improving infrastructure and services and uh, slums or informal settlements were made part of uh, poverty reduction policies so they received support not in only in terms of uh, uh, jobs uh, but also in terms of uh, housing and other uh, support the fourth intervention that was uh, successful was scaling up of successful local projects so suppose you improve certain areas and then you learn lessons uh, and then you try to replicate and uh, upscale uh, those in other parts of the city or other parts of the province or state and the nation. And lastly, uh, it was proper implementation and monitoring of the results. And I think this is uh, these five uh, interventions really cover a lot of ground. Now, uh, what you see missing here is uh, a little bit of planning, which is related to our profession. Um, but uh, these are the broader, but we, you realize that uh, in all these interventions, urban and uh, plan, urban planners and architects and engineers are involved. Okay, so uh, with that uh, sort of lessons learned from the past, let's see what is the current understanding uh, and policy advocacy on our subject today. So uh, this is the uh, latest World Cities Report uh, published a couple of years ago 
in October 2020. And the next one uh, is going to be launched uh, next month in Poland. Uh, and I, my colleagues at the UN Habitat are uh, preparing it, finalizing it. But in this very important uh, World Cities report, which focused on the value of sustainable urbanization, you can see a whole complex of uh, understanding regarding the multidimensional nature of sustainable urbanization. But since we are uh, looking at um, this, the communities, let's focus a little bit on the social dimension. So here, what we see is uh, quality of life. Okay, so we should definitely focus on that. Second is inclusivity, uh, inclusion, not only in planning and development, but other spheres. Um, and then equity, uh, there should be uh, equitable access to infrastructure services and so on. And these are, uh, this should be reflected in uh, policy coherence as well as investments from local to subnational, which may be called state in India to national level. Now, this really uh, tells us what is the current understanding or uh, and you can access that report uh, and look at more details in terms of policy advocacy i think we are familiar with the national new urban agenda which was uh, launched in uh, 2016 and last month in uh, april 2022 the uh, second uh, quadrennial report has been prepared uh, and has been presented to the General Assembly. Now, the new urban agenda focuses on three areas. First are the three transformative commitments. And the first of them deals with what we are talking about today, social inclusion and ending poverty. The second is uh, inclusive urban prosperity and opportunities for all so that no one is left behind in terms of uh, earning and livelihoods. And third is the increasingly important issue of environmentally sustainable and resilient urban development. So these kind of commitments have always been there, but uh, what is interesting under the new urban agenda, which is also aligned to the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, is effective implementation. So whether it is to build uh, an urban governance structure, uh, and there is more and more emphasis on this, and our good old uh, field of uh, planning and managing urban development. And then there are three means of implementation which are related to SDG 17, uh, which are finances, uh, capacity development, and innovation and technology. And you will hear more and more of these uh, in the coming years in terms of implementation, because until now, people have been too much focusing on planning and management and slowly urban governance came into picture. Of course, uh, as was mentioned, I did my PhD on urban governance a uh, long time ago, it seems now. Um, and uh, now there is more and more focus in, focus on innovation and technology. Uh, all sorts of apps are being developed. Uh, startups are coming up, which kind of focus on, for example, recycling of waste. A lot of startups in that area. Okay, so what is happening about new urban uh, agenda in Asia Pacific? So uh, a couple of years ago, we took uh, stock like in academic terms and brought out this book called New Urban Agenda in Asia Pacific. Uh, governance for sustainable and inclusive cities. And also um, for the UN Habitat, I prepared in December last year, this progress uh, report on the implementation of the new urban agenda in the region. And what we find is that there are several countries that uh, stand out in terms of uh, focusing on the policies and strategies uh, for example, India, Indonesia, Mongolia, and uh, Thailand. Now I know you are gonna discuss a lot about India. So I will 
talk a little bit about Mongolia and Thailand today with you. So now let's look at uh, what are the uh, some planning and development strategies that work on the ground. Uh, so I worked on Mongolia a lot. Um, and this is the kind of picture that you see if you are there in March. And the white areas, white thing you see is the ice or snow. And this is like minus 30 or 40 degrees Celsius temperature. And so if, if you were to compare anything to do with urban villages in Mongolia or informal settlement, this is how it will look like. You can see the hardly people outside in the street because it's so cold. Um, in Mongolian uh, informal urban settlements, there is no water connection. So, uh, because they are so widespread and the, water, the ground freezes up to three meters deep. So people are provided water from these water kiosks. What you see here is a kiosk number 147. And people go and buy water by cash and they take it in their can on this little push cart and they bring uh, to their homes. Of course, in winter, it's quite difficult. Traditionally in Mongolia, bringing water was the, uh, the job of kids. So even when people move from uh, countryside to urban areas, you see a large proportion of uh, water carrying is done by uh, children, teenagers, or even younger children. And uh, in this kind of environment, uh, we, uh, at the time I was uh, working with the UN Habitat as the uh, country program officer, and um, we developed a project to involve communities in upgrading the, the settlements, the gear area settlements. And we went through a time-tested uh, methodology which is being used by United Nations Habitat, which has several steps. First is uh, mobilizing the community. And uh, so you, you get everyone, uh, for example, uh, you go street by street, and then you get people to uh, involve. And there has to be 100% involvement. You cannot have any house which is not getting involved. Then what you do is you organize them in primary groups. Primary groups could be 10 families or 15 families. And then these primary groups are 10 or 15 primary groups form what is called the Community Development Council or CDCs. And then um, the CDCs, their capacity is developed in for community action planning. Because if they do not know what do they want to improve their community, uh, think of your urban village. If uh, the community does not know how to work together, what are they going to actually ask the planners and architects and engineers? So they should be organized in a purpose-built uh, uh, community development council. Okay, And they are uh, trained on the practice and then with support from the uh, technical experts, they prepare what are called the community action plans. Now these plans or caps uh, focus on the local needs, including environmental adaptation, uh, or you would call urban resilience now. Uh, this should be prepared in collaboration with the local governments, uh, which means your municipality, because they are the ones who are going to make the investment. It's not the planners that make the investment. It is the local governments, the urban local bodies. And of course, support has to be provided by technical experts. They could be architects, engineers, planners. Uh, so think of those kind of uh, you know, professionals. And then uh, there is a contract signed between either the municipality or the UN agency and the legally registered community development council which has a bank account to implement the project so the money is delivered directly to the community development council's bank account 
and they develop the uh, infrastructure or the services based on the uh, cap that has been uh, prepared in collaboration between the CDC and the municipal government. Now, this uh, combines both bottom-up and top-down approaches. And in this particular case, uh, the project that is named here, Community-Led Urban Upgrading Program, it was led by the municipal government of Ulaanbaatar, the capital city or the coldest capital in the world, with technical support by UN Habitat. And so just giving you one very simple example, this is one of the areas, uh, there were five areas. And so they uh, built uh, 15 public service infrastructure facilities, uh, which include kindergartens, community halls, and bathhouses. Now you might wonder what is bathhouse? Now you uh, heard me saying that uh, there are no water connections. So like people go to buy uh, water, there are bathhouses where you go and pay a specific amount of money to use a bathroom for half an hour or one hour. Uh, there are washing um, uh, clothes, uh, washing laundry facilities and so on, but people go uh, and take uh, a shower there. Then also 129 access infrastructure micro projects were built, including bus stops, flood channels, uh, footbridges, street lights, playgrounds, because in these areas, they're very, I mean, street lights are not there, even streets are not named. Uh, and then 11 micro projects like water kiosk uh, for drinking water. Now, this is uh, some technical expert on the left hand side speaking with the local community. And so what happened here is that uh, um, the planners and the UN specialists were told that, you know, Mongol uh, people are nomads and they may not be able to form community uh, organizations, but not only they did that, but they achieved significant improvements in terms of achieving the results and also built a sense of belonging and community togetherness, which was an added value. So in other words, they can work together between themselves as well as they can work with planners and local government. The second example I would like to share with you is from uh, Thailand, which is called Ban Mangkong or a Secure Housing Program. Now, uh, this program has been developed based on last 30, 40 years of research work, practical work on the, in the field. People have, uh, you know, devoted their entire life, something that I see in UE City to this, uh, but this is at the national level. So, um, so this program has been tackling uh, urban housing problem, uh, including improvement of settlements, uh, supporting poorest communities since 2003. It channels government funds to, uh, in the form of infrastructure subsidies and land and housing loans. So how it works is uh, it's, it's uh, implemented by a purposeful, uh, purposefully constituted institution called Community Organization Development Institute or CODI, which works under the Ministry of Social Development and Human Security. Uh, in India, this might work under some urban ministry. So how it works is that there is a subsidy component. Uh, this is the grant fund. Uh, which is uh, up to 80,000 baht, or in Indian money, it would be about uh, 1 lakh 60 to 70,000 uh, rupees. And this is given on four uh, dimensions. First, it is given for upgrading physical infrastructure and social facilities, uh, which may be within the settlement. So, whether you want to build a community hall or kindergarten or whatever. Uh, for the locals, uh, then 5% of total infrastructure development subsidy for local management costs. So local management cost because the community has to run this facility that is also provided. 
subsidy to support housing construction. So 25,000 baht or say 50,000 rupees per household uh, is provided. Uh, I think in India, this uh, fund is right now uh, is much higher than 50,000 rupees. Uh, and then support for capacity building, which is the kind of things I was saying, the community should be trained. They go to exchanges, there are community to community seminars, exchanges, not only between planners and architects, but community organization meet, and then they meet all these community development councils, meet with each other and they learn lessons. They exchange masons for construction, carpenters to work for each other. They train the masons and so on. And also then there are loans uh, for uh, housing uh, construction to individual uh, houses, uh, households, uh, which are uh, at a very low interest. Okay, so in this, uh, the latest information that is available uh, is from 2003 to 2018, in which uh, Thailand wide, uh, about 1000 housing projects have been implemented. They have supported more than 2,100 communities in 406 cities, uh, and they are spread in almost all provinces, which is 76 out of 77. They have benefited more than 1 lakh uh, 100,000 households who received secure land and housing, which means that the house they uh, built, they have access, they have a legal right to that house. And in terms of planning and redevelopment strategies, they do on site upgrading that you see in this picture, uh, re blocking. Uh, so just, uh, you know, move the houses and uh, re block, reconstruct in many cases, and land sharing. Uh, land is shared not only to uh, for greener areas, but also for other facilities, socioeconomic facilities. Okay. So this. Uh, about $400 million have been uh, provided by the, uh, the government of Thailand, out of which you see about 120 million US dollars for in grants and the rest in uh, loans. And, uh, and now the government of Thailand is uh, working to resolve the housing shortage for the communities. Uh, and they have committed for a 20 year uh, strategy uh, going from 2017 to 2039. And if you want more information, you can look at the Thailand's uh, Voluntary National Review VNR uh, for 2021, easily available on the internet. Then looking towards the future, um, we started with this uh, chart. We know we have 1 billion slum dwellers or people who live in uh, uh, communities that need planning support, infrastructure support, design support, and so on. And uh, it is uh, projected, estimated that uh, from 1 billion uh, people living in uh, such communities, maybe by 2030, there may be 2 billion. Uh, I hope not, and, and I think we should all work towards uh, preventing uh, that to happen. Um, but uh, there are some good signs. Um, this, of course, is uh, more than uh, one and a half year old, but uh, 79 urban village to be developed uh, under DDA. Um, when I read this, I found that it is going to be the normal uh, urban planning interventions, like those are given in the master plan, as it says here, for the extent master plan for Delhi. I think those are the things that uh, need to be discussed. Um, having said that, I think we should, uh, I should close this thing and I think we should all hope for a, uh, a positive outcome. Uh, because uh, the one I showed you, the Sukrali uh, village uh, in Gurgaon, they are the, um, they have uh, rejuvenated the village pond, of course, in many, uh, urbanized villages in Delhi and other parts of the NCR, they have lost their ponds and so on. But here they have been able to rejuvenate it and they feel that this pond may become even like a tourist spot. So these are the kind of aspirations uh, people have uh, to keep uh, their, uh, 
their identity, their village identity, which uh, uh, we call urban villages. Okay, with that, I will uh, close this and uh, look forward to um, a good discussion. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bharat. And the first question that has always been on my mind is, uh, why is uh, the idea on poverty and social society, I mean, social issues always connected in SDGs? In fact, uh, what we always see is that whenever we are talking about poverty, the very next uh, discussion is uh, on social issues. Uh-huh. Because, uh, you know, they, you have to cut the cake in, in some or the other way. Okay. And the, traditionally, the way the governments have been structured um, and the way uh, urban planning and management has been done, uh, traditionally, of course, it was very physical, which is still called spatial planning and planning schools. It does not talk about holistic planning. And I understand that uh, there is more and more emphasis being laid in India to exclude uh, social scientists to even get degrees in planning. Um, and I learned this uh, last year when I was in India that uh, very high level planning uh, academic institutions, they do not want social scientists uh, to become planners, uh, which is very strange. And I learned this from institutions and professors themselves, so I'm not talking about hearsay. But having said that, I think uh, uh, because there is a lack of focus on social and cultural uh, dimensions in planning, uh, and when we think of social, we think of people, because social comes from society and the society is not involved in the traditional planning that was developed under the industrial age, so uh, planning has been considered to be a technical occupation only to be done by engineers and architects. And so when you have that kind of bias, uh, of course, when you look at holistic urban planning, uh, you need to emphasize social and environmental dimensions. And as a result, you talk about social. You're right, sir. Hello, uh, Dr. Bharat. I have a question. Yes, yes we'll go on. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, very interesting, the cases that you explained uh, with examples and photographs. It makes life uh, really clear as to how this sort of authentic uh, and actual implemented work has been going on, uh, you know, in different parts of the world. Uh, so I noticed between the two cases that you explained, one was for um, uh, public uh, services, let's say water, something that is shared between the people. The other was for some, something which is very personal to individual families and, and people, which is housing. So uh, like you mentioned about the housing part being tackled uh, in, in terms of the funding, right? And I want to understand in the previous case, how is the public service part is handled in terms of funding? Uh, because I, I believe local govern, government is involved, but at the same time, uh, people cannot, uh, people of these communities at least cannot uh, participate or neither can they have a say or neither do have the funds to have public commons being uh, you know, uh, provided to them. So how is usually that tackled? Yeah, you are talking about the Thailand case, correct? Uh, the yes. The, actually, Thailand case uh, is, is a very specific example for housing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me explain. Thank you. That's yeah. a good, good question. Yeah. Now, uh, in uh, Thailand, I think maybe I did not emphasize enough. I was too much looking at my clock. But uh, what uh, the housing and community infrastructure goes together. So there is a grant for community infrastructure uh, and there is a uh, grant plus loan for building the house, okay? So the entire community infrastructure is funded by the government to, uh, 
to get access to that grant funding and to get access to the individual housing loan, the community 100% households have to work together. If one household is not, they cannot go to CODI and access the grant fund. So CODI says that unless you are all organized and you show that you are organized for one year and you are running say, uh, self-help or uh, saving uh, and credit groups, which means you are saving every month and show that you have your own little credit uh, record of saving funds, um, it's credit history in other words, uh, because then uh, the community organization um, monitors the bank books of each household, okay? Because it's their organization, so there is nothing hidden between them, okay? And so they make sure that every household deposit X amount of money because that is the money they will have to be depositing in the bank when they take the housing loan. So this practice, you can see how, how much uh, social engagement is uh, what uh, uh, Professor Anand was asking, uh, how much social investment has to go on in terms of organizing the people. But the good news and the good result of that is that people are not removed from where they live. They are given access to the land there, everybody is involved and then they have this great sense of ownership and because of that, they are able to access that uh, fund from the government. I think in India, what we have is individual housing support uh, and the community support is just done by the government, not by the entire involvement of the local community. Maybe it is thought that this is too much of a transaction cost um, or too much of a planning uh, input and effort. But I think, you know, that leads to sustainability. That's uh, that's what we are talking about. Totally, totally agreed. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or uh, curiosities? Uh, Dr. Bharat, uh, I'm fairly unsettled looking at the presentations that you had shared because the energy in India is entirely different. You know, uh, what I was seeing in uh, the two cases that were presented was that the settlement and uh, the settlement densities were not as high as in India, in the other uh, urban villages in India. What is happening here? Uh, you are also aware of what is happening here, but uh, what is happening here is that there is over construction and over energy, and the government is not able to uh, make a dent into the space, uh, neither by ownerships of public or private uh, lands, nor by uh, trying to check them through rules, regulations, or governance. So it is the people, you know, when I look at, uh, in fact, what the Council of Architecture president said that it was, it is Indians inside and Indians outside the Laldora now is actually the situation. So uh, I'm just sharing uh, it by way of, uh, you know, uh, trying to find a solution that the yeah. situation here is very complex and the energy is very high. Yeah. I think the energy is high because uh, the government, because of the way the cities have developed and larger cities grow very fast and the land value is in favor of the middle and higher income groups and very rich people. So as a result, what you see is the land around the uh, urban villages has already been taken up for middle income or high income groups. So where are your service class going to go and live? And they are going to find, uh, so there is, they are going to find the cheaper housing in urban villages. You know, I used to study in, in uh, JNU and there's Munir Kagao next to it. And uh, Munir Ka had um, so many people living in the, uh, you know, those one room uh, ten, tenements. Now, um, so that you have one side, you have the demand. And this, on the other side, the people who used to live in the Lal Dora traditionally, they lost their lands uh, and they were from all the different caste of the village, okay? 
and some of them maybe got some jobs, but some of them maybe did not. And all that they could do was to just build an extra room or two rooms or three rooms. And when they see that this can be put into the market, they are they are going to bring that energy. They're going to take informal loans from their relatives. They're going to uh, create those buildings. So uh, it is not that they have too much energy. I think that energy is because of the lack of the provision of low income housing by the system for all the people who are providing the low cost services, uh, cheaper services, whether you have drivers, auto rickshaw drivers, maids, uh, and so on. I mean, uh, cleaners, I mean, you name it, uh, people who, uh, you know, run your kiosk, um, vendors, where are they going to live? They all live in those areas simply because I think you cannot pinpoint today in Delhi or any big metro area that this was the great low income settlement that the government built. I don't think you will be able to find, you can count on your 10 fingers in a city, historically speaking, okay? So if you have such a neglect of low income population, what are you going to get? You're going to get energy where it is available, where it can sprout. And that's where you have the energy of the uh, uh, construction of buildings for ten tenements uh, in the urban village Laldora. Right. There is a question from uh, Smita Dattamakija. Smita Makija had been a part of the faculty when I, when I was doing my master's program at SPA, uh, you know, she is asking, are these initiatives to build the community cohesion by the government? Are there some processes listed, tested and reported? In India or abroad? Uh, she is generally questioning about the uh, in general. Pieces, yeah, in general. Yeah. Oh. Okay, yeah, I mean, there are outside, there is so much work has been done. I would, uh, uh, I would share with you um, a link to the guidebooks, which were prepared by UN Habitat and UN SCAP. Amazingly, they are available in Hindi also. There are about eight to nine small A5 size guidebooks, which talk about the importance of poor urban communities. Uh, their land issues, how their land, they, how they can be provided access to land, how they should be supported to build housing. And these, these guidelines were written based on enormous experience uh, in and around, in and beyond Asia Pacific region. And I will uh, look for these uh, guides um, um, for, uh, for you and send you, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So they have been translated into uh, many languages. Um, and uh, they're called uh, housing the poor in Asian cities. And then they were they were adapted to Africa. And if you go to UN Habitat website, you will find the same title give, being given for African cities. And I think a few days ago, uh, uh, like for for example, I'm going to copy paste this in your uh, chat box. Uh, this is a guidebook on eviction. Okay, I'm just when I put it, it just comes up. Okay, so this is just one of them, and it says number four. Uh, and then you have, I think, up to eight or nine. The late, last one was on uh, informal settlements or poor. Uh, uh, and the uh, urban resilience, how to build urban resilience for uh, rural communities and their settlements. Okay. Yes. Uh, and I, I was looking for, but it's the link is not coming up. So I will share with you the link, uh, then you can uh, circulate it. Okay. I really That's want good. to thank you, Mr. Dhaya. Your presentation has been very enlightening and useful. Like we will be able to take information and strategies to ground. 
थैंक यू स्मिता जी थैंक यू Dr Bharat I would like to conclude this session with uh, a lot of thanks to you for sparing this time and the energy that your discussion carried and the honesty that it carried too uh we are all eagerly seeking solutions in fact down the years we have been having studios on urban villages and it has they have always ended with identification of issues architects need to learn to go beyond architecture to actually find solutions and maybe uh, not just beyond architecture maybe maybe into human thinking maybe into human thought or maybe you know we have to increase our uh, spectrum maybe policy has to change but some change is required and that is what we are searching uh, thank you for this enlightenment